pure spaz at that point came out of me. <laughs> Until my teammates were there to, to at least cover me up, you know, from the embarrassment. Yeah. This podcast is brought to you by Microsoft Teams. Where there's a team, there's a way. Hey everybody, what's up? Trey Wingo here. Hope everything is well with you. Got another great episode of Half Forgotten History for you here. Now, I know I know that we teased James Harrison, uh, the former Defensive Player of the Year coming up this week, but we had a special opportunity to talk to someone that I think you're going to enjoy. And so, James, we love you, and we're just pushing you for a week. It's not on me. Blame the producers, because I'm terrified of you. Uh, we're talking to Alex Smith this week. Alex just retired. Uh, obviously, the comeback story last year was remarkable. Um, and his ability to tell it is just amazing. So we took the opportunity, and this week's episode is now Alex Smith talking about the fears and anxieties he felt from being the number one overall pick in 2005 to becoming a quality quarterback and then potentially losing his leg and possibly his life and to come back and play football again. It's truly inspiring. This episode is brought to us by Microsoft Teams. Here now is Alex Smith. Alex, let's, let's start here. Let's say some guy comes up to you the week before the draft in 2005 and says, I have seen the future. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to go number one overall. You're going to play 16 seasons. You're going to, after initial struggles, lead the team that drafted you, the Niners, to the NFC championship game. But the next year, they're going to bench you for another quarterback. Then you're going to go to Kansas City. You're going to have the best season statistically of your life. And the next year, they're going to bench you for another quarterback. And then you're going to go play for another team, have this incredibly awful injury, and find your way back and become the comeback player of the year. What would you say to someone if that's what they told you your career was going to be? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> you know, in perspective, it doesn't sound that all that bad until you get to the injury part. Uh you know, obviously, this this it was a it was this this was a it was a life changing injury for me, uh, flat out. I mean, it just absolutely my life has yeah. changed. And obviously, looking back, for me, I'm so thankful for it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in in the big picture, I remember I remember pre draft uh, sitting down with like you know some people uh, close to me, like you know, you all of a sudden you're I was 20 and you're like hiring a financial advisor. I'm like, what 20 year olds hiring a financial advisor? Right. You know. And I remember sitting down and you're like setting out these plans, you know, moving forward, like long-term plans. And I remember thinking like, God, if I could play 10 years, that would be amazing. You know, like 10 years was the mark. Yeah. Like if, if you could get to double digits and then, um, you know, it was hard. It was those first few years in, in San Fran were tough. You know, like it was, it was a lot of turnover, a lot of turmoil, uh, not a lot of wins, not a lot of success. And so it definitely took my lumps and, but I think learned a lot about myself. I, I definitely struggled a lot with, with the expectations of being the number one pick, you know, of, of, of being, you know, the Niners franchise quarterback and the lineage that, that obviously comes before you. And, um, you know, for me, I, you know, I got, I was consumed with other people's validation, you know, what are people thinking about me, you know, and I had to, I had to constantly prove to people that I was deserving. I was, you know, scared to death to make a mistake. You know, and it, like, yeah. it was paralyzing for a long time. And I, and I think I learned a lot about myself, um, you know, and, and, and that kind of that negative self-talk and that spiral that you can go down until I finally was able to snap out of it and, and, and finally kind of, you know, start to reach my potential. So I guess long story short, I'm not sure I told that person um, if they'd have told me that I, I, in a lot of ways, obviously a lot of great things to be thankful for a 16 year career. And I never would have never would have thought it, but um you know, a wild road nonetheless. Yeah, you talked about a lot of that anxiety when you gave the commencement speech at the University of Utah yeah. 2014. And I thought that was really cool because I'm sure, especially there, you're such an icon and you had gotten to a really good place in your career at that point. I think it's important for people to understand. And I say this when we talk about the draft all the time, especially you, you're babies. You guys are babies when you come into this and suddenly you're this this fix all cure all thing and the pressure can really get to you no doubt and I think the combination for me was such a unique combination I mean I, I was a nothing recruit uh, a yeah. nothing recruit I mean I went out for freshman football in high school and my dad who played college ball and one of the reasons I love football I mean he, he asked me honestly if I, I thought I should go run cross country instead um, <laughs> I mean I was I, I mean I was a 
uh, to say I was a nothing recruit is a, is an overstatement, you know? And, and so I got to fly under the radar and there's a freedom that comes with that. And I love football. Football has been my passion since I was a kid and, and, and to play college football, that's really all I ever dreamt about. And then I got the opportunity, you know, the University of Utah gave me, they were the only school that gave me that opportunity. And I like, man, I, I relished it. And I went up there and there were zero expectations for me when I got there. I didn't care. I was playing college ball. It was my dream. And, and I went as hard as I could. And, you know, obviously pretty lucky to get to play for a guy named Urban Meyer uh, and Dan Mullen at Utah and, you know, changed my life. But in the matter of weeks, I came out early as an underclassman. And in a matter of weeks, I went from like, I mean, people didn't even recognize me on campus, let alone <laughs> around the country, let alone around the country. And then boom, thrust with being the number one overall pick. And for me, the combination of like, well, yeah, I mean, you're, Peyton Manning is the number one pick and he had set the bar. And, you know, like you said, going to be in the franchise quarterback and deserving all this. So I was constantly terrified people were going to find out that I didn't belong there. You know, like that I, I was a fraud. Uh, like I said, terrified to make a mistake. Um, and it was just a, it was a, a negative space and really a, a spiral that I, you know, I, I added to myself, you know, that anxiety, yeah. that negative self-talk, that, 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 uh, self-doubt that we all deal with at times. Um, you know, for me, it was real and I was in it and it was, it, 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 it was heavy. It was burdensome. Um, and it took me several years to kind of finally shrug that off to change, you know, to change my perspective towards it. Uh, until I was able to finally, you know, give myself a chance, give myself a self a chance of success and climbing out of it. And, and it, you know, what do you know, I got out of my own way and, 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 and uh, finally did. Was there a moment uh, at a practice or a game that really sparked that for you? Or was it a process? Because as, you know, as we all know, the first couple of years weren't so great. And then it just seemed like it took off after like year four, which is very rare, by the way. Yeah. You know, for me, there were a couple things in life. Certainly I took things from a lot of, you know, those years doing it. Um, you know, my fourth year there, my best friend in life committed suicide. Um, and it was in the middle of training camp and I was kind of in the midst of a quarterback competition and still trying to find my way and my footing. And, you know, obviously kind of consumed, uh, with all my, you know, the self-talk that I'm talking about and all the stuff I got going on. And, and I missed a few, I missed a few of his phone calls in camp. And then a couple of days later, uh, he took his own life and, uh, the regret you have, you know, from something like that, of not being able to pick up the phone, you know, I was, I really wasn't present. I was, you know, I was consumed in my own thoughts and, and self-doubt and, you know, often, you know, some other place and, and certainly wasn't where I needed to be in, in, in the present moment. And, so yeah, and, and obviously he was kind of dealing with his own his own things, and um, so it was a huge wake up call for me, certainly, about I think mental health, um, about uh, you know yeah I, I think our our own space, our you know the things that we deal with internally, uh, and and really perspective towards them. I didn't fully recognize yeah. that I was where I was at in those years. I, I think I was kind of naive i didn't want to believe that like where i was and, and it, i think it finally helped me recognize like I'm, I'm this is not i'm not in a good place i'm not dealing with this the right way and then i was able to kind of finally change that and you know try to find a better way a, a different way it's interesting because usually a traumatic event like that can have a very negative effect but it, it seems like it sort of freed you up a little bit almost oh for sure yeah i mean i think a little bit it was like you know i thought this was like big big potatoes, what I was dealing with, oh, all the QB competition and, you know, obviously the pressure of, of playing and a career and being a franchise quarterback, yada, 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 like in the big picture, you know, like it, it, it's not that, not that big a deal, you know? And uh, yeah. that, I think that was a, a wake up call for me um, to start approaching it like that. You know, obviously it's a challenge and it's hard and difficult, but like, uh, I, you know, I, like I said, I think I was agonizing over it. Um, you know, clearly too much and, and really kind of become, you know, my own worst enemy. And 2011 really was the breakout year for you. You guys go 13 and three, you win the division, you have the great win over the Saints uh, at Candlestick. And uh, a lot of people called that touchdown run by you a swagless celebration, but I, I, I loved it. You know, it's like, hey, it's still, I did, you know. <laughs> still the worst celebration of my career, maybe of the NFL. You know, it was a third down. It was this yeah. huge play in the game. And all I'm thinking, and they call this, we dial up this QB sweep. And I'm like, QB sweep? You know, Greg Roman calls it. And I'm just like, I better get this freaking first down. And so all I'm like, 
riffing the sticks over there. And it was like a third and six or seven, I think. And I'm like, dude, I, whatever it takes, I got to get this first down. Like, I, I might have to go airborne, like, whatever. Like, I'm giving it up right now. And so then all of a sudden it was like, oh, I turned the corner and it's me and Joe Staley turning the corner for the end zone. And in the blink of an eye, I'm in the end zone. Pure spaz at that point came out of me. <laughs> Until my teammates were there to, to at least cover me up, you know, from the embarrassment. Yeah. But yeah, there was a good, good couple of seconds there of pure, pure spaz, like that I'm not proud of, yeah, at all. Well, the good news is no one ever replays it, so it'll never be yeah. seen again. Um, uh, so, so, so obviously the NFC Championship game doesn't go the way you want. Uh, obviously, a couple of fumbles on punt returns yeah. really sort of changed yeah. that game. So, when did you get the feeling? Because I, I remember there was this classic photo, or or maybe it happened, like. Jim Harbaugh, your coach, was caddying for you. Was it Cypress yep. or Pebble? Somewhere, yep. right? Yep. I, you're my guy. I, I'm, we're, we're through this thick or thin. And then, lo and behold, the next season, hey, we got this other guy. Like, wh when yeah. did you start to think, I may not be long for the starter here? Oh, I mean, it was pretty quick there once. You know, I, I started the first 10 games of that season. Yeah. And I think – I and it was even better than the year before. Like, it was – you know, second year in the offense, it was the first time I'd ever had two years in the same offense. And it was year eight for me at that point. And I felt like even, even more comfortable and more command of what we were doing. We were obviously really talented uh, as a team. And so it was like, man, here, I, I went through all those lumps, you know, and all those years and like, we come out of it and like, man, this is it. Like, you know, and, and, uh, and so we're rolling and 10 games in, I think I'm leading the NFL in QB rating at that point. Yeah. Um, and boom, the concussion, and I don't play the next week, and Cat plays, and so he, I'd been with him those, you know, he was there the year before even, so I'd been with him, and, you know, obviously, he's a good kid, and, you know, I knew, yeah. you don't fully know, though, until you get out there and play the quarterback, oftentimes in practice, we got jerseys on and stuff, it's, it's always hard to, like, I think, make that correlation, but especially a guy like Cap, who had so many tools, and it was pretty apparent there pretty quick uh, that he could play, you know, they, I mean, it was immediately the first couple, that first game. I mean, he went out and, and uh, lit it up as a young quarterback. And um, obviously he, he starts the rest of the year and goes on a crazy historic run for, you know, first seven games or whatever it was there into the playoffs, into the Super Bowl. Um, and obviously as, as it, you know, as we obviously go into that run, it was very apparent that, that I was going to be moving on. Um, yeah. But for me, it was kind of like, well, I'm ready for my next opportunity. I think I had learned a lot and was ready for that next opportunity and kind of uh, relishing it. Well, you go to a potentially could not go to a better situation. You go to Kansas city with obviously a, a head coach and Andy Reed, who has for throughout his career, whatever quarterbacks he works with, they have their best years with him. What, what was it or what is it about Andy that you think allows him to do that? Yeah, this was, I mean, the intriguing thing for me from afar was, he had done it with so many different types of quarterbacks. You know, it wasn't like these guys were all the same, a lot of them different tool sets, and they'd all had success under Coach Reed. And I, and I didn't obviously understand why. I'd always heard, you know, Coach Reed's this West Coast quarterback. You know, he's got the West Coast playbook. And pretty quickly you get around Coach and you realize, yeah, we're, we're, we're using West Coast language, but not much is off the table with Coach Reed from an X's and O's standpoint that he is, he is insanely creative, uh, fearless as far as let's try this, let's do this, and freeing. He's such a great teacher, um, and, and I think that's what he is at his core as a teacher. He loves football. He loves teaching. It was, it was freeing for me that, hey, he's going to continue to put me in opportunities. Let's, let's utilize your strengths. And I'd spent a good portion of my early career – you know, I'd come from playing in the shotgun with Ur in Urban in, in college, and it was gimmicky. And I could I be a pro quarterback? Those were oftentimes right. the questions that you had to answer when I got drafted. Could I be a pro pro style quarterback? And um, I think thankfully that day has come and gone, and, and guys don't have to answer that anymore. But I spent a long time trying to answer those questions. And and Coach Reed was so freeing in the sense like we incorporated a bunch of the QB run stuff. We did a lot of stuff that I felt like I had that were my strengths. And he built it around your strengths. And I think that's just obviously the sign of a great coach, any great coach. It wasn't just this West Coast system. Coach Reed really tailored it around all his players um, and what they did well. And, and he tried to obviously put you in those situations out there. So, um, yeah, incredibly thankful that, that 
you know, obviously I did get to spend those five years with him, you know, and that staff, you know, certainly changed my career. Well, certainly you put up great numbers. And then of course the 2017 draft rolls around and yeah. they make the big move up to get the guy I call the unicorn yeah. <laughs> in Patrick Mahomes. And I'll never forget the first mini camp or OTA that you guys did after the draft, you were very much aware of the situation. Like you don't make that move without knowing he's going to be the guy. And it was like listening to your first interview after it's like, he knows already, like you knew from the first mini camper OTA that, yep, probably after this year, I'll be moving on again. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, for me looking back, thankful, it's funny. Like it was, I knew even before we drafted Pat, like that, that was all communicated. You know, I, I knew all along what we were doing, why we were doing it. I also knew that I had, you know, uh, the, you know, coach had, had given me hundred percent confidence. Like I had the keys to the car that year, you know, and, and for me, I was going into year, whatever that was 12 or, um, and it was like, you can't ask, you can't, you can't ask for much more than that. Like I had the keys to the car for a whole year. You know, if I didn't play that well and say, we didn't draft Patrick, if I didn't play well that year, I was going to be out regardless. They were going to go find somebody right. else. You know what I'm saying? Like they're at that, when you get to that point in your career, it's, it's, it's usually always kind of year to year. And so for me, that's, that's all you could really ask for. I was going to run with it, um, as far as I could and as fast as I could. And, and, you know, and ended up having, um, you know, the best year of my career, certainly. And so yeah. I was okay with it. I, like I said, it was all clearly communicated. I, there, were, there were no surprises. Um, I, I think equally, uh, you know, I think Coach Reed did such a great job, obviously, of over communicating um, the entire situation and where everybody was at. Yeah, I mean, you, it was the best year of your career. Highest completion percentage, most yards, most touchdowns, uh, tied your few interceptions, and lo and behold, yeah. then, then the Ferrari takes over. When did you know well, how good Mahomes was going to be? Oh, I, I mean, you knew you knew all along um, that he was really, really smart, worked really, really hard, crazy uh, competitive, and 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 I think it was really apparent that he could process information. Yeah. You know, it didn't take that long for him to catch up to speed in the meeting rooms, how we talked on the sideline. He saw things fast. He knew he knew. And then week 17, you know, we had, uh, we clinched whatever yeah. seed and we couldn't get any better. So we didn't play. And, and he played and against Patrick Denver. Got, Patrick got his first yeah. start. And like, yeah, at that point you're like, yeah, I mean, he played the whole game and you knew he had it. He knew he really had it, you know, to get that kind of a chunk to get the game plan, get to go play against a, an NFL team in a regular season game and then play the way he did. It was obviously like, yeah, this is, this is it. And so for me then, yeah, I mean, I knew we were going to the playoffs. That was it. And that had kind of been the, the story that, you know, my career in Kansas City was like, well, we, you know, went to playoffs four out of the five years. It was really a matter of, of obviously how far can you take it. And, you know, once we, we lost that game to the Titans, um, you know, certainly disappointing and, and felt like we could have achieved more. Well, certainly wish you would have run the ball to Kareem Hunt more in the second half of that game, especially <laughs> with Kelsey out. But that's a separate issue oh, we won't get kidding. into now. Uh, all right, let's take a quick break here in my conversation with Alex Smith. And when we come back, we'll talk about the moment that changed his life forever and potentially cost him his life and the amazing comeback that we saw on the football field last year. That's next with Alex Smith. Microsoft Teams is helping Priority Bicycles reinvent the way they work. When the pandemic hit, the bike shop had to close their New York City showroom. Now they found a way to reopen by doing virtual visits on Teams. And now the team can meet with two or three times the number of customers they could before, and people from all over the world can visit their showroom. Learn more about their story and others at Microsoft.com slash Teams. Let, let's move on to the fateful day, November 18th, 2018. Yep. What did you remember right away about the injury? I, you know, it's funny. I, I mean, I laugh at it. It's so ridiculous, like my mindset. I mean, I'm like, oh, my leg's broken. Like, I mean, clearly it wasn't bending yeah. in the right way. Like it was a feeling yeah. I've never had before in, in my leg. And I look down and it's not straight where it should be. And I'm like, oh, my leg, my leg's broken. <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, that's a, you know, I was like super bummed. I'm like, it's over. That's what I remember distinctly thinking that the season's over. We were two games up in the division and I yep. still felt like we could have played. We could play so much better. We still hadn't even come close to reaching our potential. And bummed that the season was over and you know but yeah i'll have my surgery the you know best doctors in the world you know and they're gonna patch me up and um you know i'll get back this spring i'll get back this spring yeah. to, to kind of getting back to where we left off and that was kind of my thought you know you hear about broken bones all the time and i didn't make much of this one 
Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it decided to make something out of it. Yeah. When, when, when was the first sign that wait a minute, something's really wrong here? Like, when did you, when did you, did you feel something? Did you see something that created the infection that, that put the infection? No. In your, when did you no. know? I didn't even know that it was a compound fracture until we got off the field into the x-ray room. You know, they air casted me. Yeah. We, I got some x-rays done right then off the field. And at that point it was being discussed that we may or may not have surgery right away. And then our doctor, Dr. West opened up the air cast and there was some blood pooling at the bottom of the air cast. And, you know, obviously things changed immediately. It was, you know, off to emergency surgery uh, because of the compound break. And it was a really small little puncture uh, on the backside of my calf. And, but I still, it was kind of like, okay, well, she's like, well, we have to go in, you know, now just obviously there's a little bit of a risk of infection and, and, uh, I woke up the next day and, you know, the bone was really well aligned. Surgery had gone well from that perspective and things were looking good. And it was just kind of a matter of looking forward to getting discharged. And I had to stay a few days uh, to get monitored in the hospital and before I could go home. But I mean, still looking, still looking good at that point. I was still kind of just thinking about my recovery. And obviously, Stefania Bell, my former colleague at ESPN, did an amazing documentary with you. And it was so cool to get the access to that. Um, but when, when, when did you really think, okay, I got a problem? Like, yeah, what, what was I, well, the a, moment? It was a distinct, there was a distinct moment. Um, so a few days later, I was supposed to get discharged the day before Thanksgiving on that Wednesday. And I was still kind of running a mild fever and I was having some decent pain in my leg. Nothing alarming though. Like, they, you know, they'd looked at my leg and, and my vitals were still okay. And, you know, so they, they talked me into staying one more night. Um, so that I would get discharged the Thursday on Thanksgiving day. Like the plan was to get discharged that morning. And that night um, I slipped into unconsciousness and fever spiked. My blood pressure dropped and I went into septic shock. And I, the last thing I remember as all this was kind of happening, it was happening frantically uh, that our doctor ran in. It was really late. I don't remember the hour uh, in, in the middle of the night and they unwrapped my leg again and i had seen my leg i think 12 hours prior though the, you know when they unwrapped it to look at the you know the wounds and then they unwrapped it again and, and my entire calf was black um on the front of my shin and like that's the last thing i remember before i kind of lost consciousness for for about 10 days and obviously being you know seeing your body part that black and, and clearly realizing that obviously that that's that's not good okay so obviously that must have been traumatic and I remember at one point they they told everybody, okay, listen, we may need to lose a leg to save a life here. Um, yeah, that, what's yeah. it like to process that information? You know, luckily I was literally out of it for that entire time when it was really that serious, um, you know, and the infection was creeping up my leg, you know, and they're continuing to cut it out every single day. And uh, I'm on, you know, a ton of antibiotics trying to get this thing under control. My wife dealt with all that, you know, and, and very real. I think they were, you know, on the doorstep hours from like, we're going to cut this leg off to save, to save my life. And, um, you know, thankful, obviously, that, that they got the infection under control. And then that I had an amazing team of surgeons that were able to save my leg at that point. Because now I've got this crazy spiral fracture, no, no flesh on the whole front of my leg. It, you know, it's halfway been cut off already. And now they want to do this, this, you know, perform limb salvage, which is going to be a bunch of surgeries, moving body parts, you know, the Frankenstein thing that all sounded crazy, but that's kind of what I woke up to. And I woke up to that yeah. decision of, do you want to cut your leg off? Which some doctors were definitely proposing as being the easier, faster, cleaner, you know, better recovery outcome. And then, or I could have a bunch of surgeries to try and save it. And they were gonna to have to move the body parts and now I'm, I'm learning this all for the first time in a matter of hours and having to make a decision. And so that was hard. I, a lot of shock. I'm like, how did we get here? I was playing football. Like, how, how did we get to this point? Yeah. And so um, a lot of shock, not wanting to have to make either of those decisions. You know, I don't, I'm like, I don't, is there a third option? I don't want to do either of these. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thankful, obviously, to have great surgeons and ultimately their confidence in the limb salvage that they could save my leg. Um, I think led me to, to pulling the trigger and going down that route. Cause that's the next question. How do you go from, Oh, thank God. I still have a leg. Hey, I think I want to do this football thing again. I mean, you have yeah. to be a little bit of a good, a used car salesman here to convince people that that's a good idea. Well, yeah, it's funny. I mean, when, 
by the way, when this was all happening, like football was off the table. I mean, this was like, hey, we're going to try and save your legs so that you can walk a little bit. Maybe, you know, like that was the outcome we were hoping for is maybe you'll be able to stand on it and walk around a little bit. Um, anything beyond that was kind of going to be uh, icing on the cake. And so, yeah, it's been a long time just again, you know, it's funny about mental health. Like I spent a long time just going down this rabbit hole of all the things I'll never be able to do again. Like they were gone like, out of my life. Like, I mean, you named the activity and I was like, well, I'll never be able to do that again. I'll never be able to do that again. And football, like that was an afterthought. Like, yeah, of course that's gone. But I, I mean, I was more worried about, you know, wrestling around with my kids and chasing them around and doing stuff with my wife and traveling. And like, I, you know, there were a thousand things I was worried about that then I was just basically like in the, of the mindset that that's, it's gone. It's, it's never coming back. Like, and really depressed about obviously the situation and, 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 what my future was going to hold. Uh, it wasn't until again, I think that I, I, I got to start my rehab and that perspective changed, you know, thankful for the military's role in that, you know, the people down at the center for the intrepid that really helping me push about, you know, all the things I could do that I could find a way that I could adapt and that I, I still could go do a lot. And I was pumped to go try and find out. And it, it wasn't until I got to go down there and, um, I think feel that energy and, and really them kind of helped me get out of that, that hole I was in and until, and they helped me kind of first utter the words, you know, like, yeah, I want to see if I can play again. Like that was really scary and crazy to say. I mean, I couldn't even stand when I said it and I had a metal cage bolted into my leg. Like it was, um, crazy to say at the time. Um, but it was also amazing and freeing to kind of go pursue that and like, you know, no one. Who cares if I fail? Like, that's fine. I want to pursue this and, and see what I have left. So what did it mean to you personally to step on that field again last season? Like, I, I, we, it, was a, it was an incredible moment. Like, we all saw it as it happened. But, like, what was going through your mind? Like, this is actually happening. I never thought it would happen. I truly never thought it would happen. I thought, I thought it would end way, way before that, long before that. And so to actually get there was – such an amazing rush of emotions, you know, for me, looking back on my team, the team off the field that, that, that helped me get there, you know, starting obviously with my wife and kids, but all, all the doctors and nurses and physical therapists that had spent hours and hours and hours investing into me and to get back to that moment and actually see it through. Cause it was, it was scary as hell. Like I was, I was so scared uh, to do that and to go face it and get out there and that first tackle obviously to get back up from it was su such a good feeling so freeing um that i knew i was okay i'd spent two years walking around on eggshells um you know terrified of the slightest little slip up and here i am running out into harm's way intentionally going to get tackled by some of the biggest strongest guys in the world um and knowing I, including I aaron be, donald by the way that's right. aaron yeah, donald but, like really yeah. like it had to be Aaron Don like there were a couple of plays in that game like oh god oh oh please no for sure not you know it was funny in my wildest dreams when you dream about coming back and what that may look like you know facing the Rams uh and Aaron Donald and it's raining um yeah. and he you know the first tackle he jumps on my back I'm not sure I've on your back tackled. yes I've never I've never been tackled like that ever and of course my first tackle back after this you know he, gets, he jumps on my back but it's so funny. It was, it was, a, it was a, a, a frustrating game, you know, and, and not, not what I was hoping for, but in a lot of ways it helped me shake uh, that fear off. I needed that. I needed to kind of get hit a bunch. And, and for me, it was freeing because they're going forward. I really didn't think about my leg anymore. And yeah. it was so cool to get back to that point. Um, really this giant mountain for me at, at the end of the road, uh, and, and to be able to climb it and get through it and work it, work through that and to come out the other side, it was, it, it was amazing. So obviously I, I, again, I never expected it. So it was, it was so surreal. Yeah. I, I, you can survive a mountain of a man of Aaron Donald. I guess anything is okay yeah. after that. that and uh, no doubt. I feel like yeah. moving forward in life, like I, I feel like I don't have limitations because I pursued football. Yeah. And you are moving forward in life. You, you're moving on to your post NFL career and, and you are really involved with UFOs. Uh, tell me a little bit about what's going on there. Yeah, it, honestly, this is this is such a, a cool thing. So this goes back. I've been wearing UFOs for seven or eight years. This was, went back way before my injury. Uh, I discovered them in Hawaii. I, I thought they were this Hawaiian brand. I got to spend. I spent some time out there with my family in the off season, and 
you get to do a lot in a day and you're obviously in flip-flops a lot as well. And I just found that I, when I put them on, I felt better. And I, you know, at that point I was, you know, I, dealing with a little bit of back pain throughout my career. And I felt like when I wore them, it was like someone took a, a pressure relief valve on my low back. And, and I remember bringing them back. I brought them back to the, to the, the QB room in KC. I mean, I gave a pair to like Nick Poles and Tyler Bray. And I was like, you guys got to try these things. They're, they're amazing. At that time, I, I didn't know anything about them. I, I, I thought they, like I said, I thought it was this like Hawaiian brand come to find out they're, they're based out of new England. And then I've been wearing them ever since. And especially in my recovery, cause I would do you know, these really, really hard physical therapy sessions, you know, like when I was trying to weight bear again and walk again, and it, obviously dealing with a lot of soreness and pain. And I would come home and immediately I, I'd get into my UFOs. Like they've, they made me feel that much better. They just took a load off, took an impact off. And, and I literally would wear them around the house 24 seven and fast forward to, I make the 53 man roster and we have practice that day and I come home and my wife and kids do this surprise champagne shower for me. Yep. And that's I'm, the video that went viral. And my, and, my, and my wife posted it and I'm wearing UFOs in the video. Cause like, that's what I, when I came home, I put them on. And so that was the first time then they, there was like a correspondence back and forth uh, over social media with my wife. And I'm like, well, I've been wearing them for, for years. This is something that I believe in. And, and, uh, so that kind of sparked this relationship. And so it's cool to actually be, you know, obviously there's, a, you know, you do endorsements over the course of yeah. your career. And this one is so organic. It's so real. It's something that I definitely, I 100% believe in. Um, I don't think there's another thing out there like it. Um, and so I just trying to encourage people, if, if you're dealing, if you're active, if you're rolling, if you're dealing with any kind of um, lower body pain, back pain, I mean, I think it, it sells itself. Go give them a try. They're an amazing company, amazing culture. And, and the product is real. It's one of a kind. So uh, for me, I just uh, pumped it to be partnered with them. Size 11. That's all I'm saying. Size it's 11. coming. Trey, it's coming. Okay. It's done. All right, good. Done. Good. All right. Well, well listen, I, I know you're busy and you got a lot of things to do, but uh, your story has always been fascinating to me because I was there at the beginning and through it all. And uh, it was just, it was like football can break your heart a million different ways. And you know that better than anybody. So what happened last year was one of the coolest things I can remember in my 30 years of, of covering the game. And it was just, it, it was great to see, and it's great to see you doing well. And uh, well, we just wish you all the best going forward, man. Trey, thank you so much, man. That means, that means a lot, truly. So once again, thanks to Alex Smith for joining us. Uh, just a remarkable story. We wish him all the best going forward uh, in his post-playing career. And coming up next week, again, I promise, it's James Harrison. I'm not going to push him twice because if I do push him twice, I feel like he will hunt me down and take the pool cue that's sitting over there and beat me to a pulp with it. My own pool cue, that would be bad. So that's next week, James Harrison on Have Forgotten History, I promise.